Good evening, President, Fellows and Guests. Um, this evening, John and I are going to talk to you um, about the results of this work at RAF Lakenheath. We are very close to submitting um, two volumes for, uh, for refereeing, and what we're going to present today is really sort of um, the results of the research that we've been carrying out. I'm going to talk to you really about the background and the fieldwork results, and then John will uh, give you some of the more, the more detailed research afterwards. RAF Lakenheath lies in northwest West Suffolk on the western edge of Breckland, which is a special environmental area characterised with fine blowing sands, and the eastern edge of the Fens, which is um, characterised by its uh, brackish and freshwater lakes and marshes. The Fen Edge, as, as an area of um, varied landscape, off much too early settlers um, in terms of um, rich summer pasture and light soils um, for farming and dry winter grazing. So it's an area that's been um, actively populated through most periods. East Anglia was in the forefront of um, the early Anglo-Saxon occupation of the 5th century. Uh, we've got some uh, renowned 5th century cemeteries, Bonhill up here, uh, Lapford down here in Suffolk. And then in the later period, um, further occupation, um, some of the cemeteries that you will have heard of, Morningthorpe in Norfolk here and Burr Acton. And then on the Suffolk coast, Carlton Colville Snape, and of course the Royal Burial Grounds at Sutton Hoo and the settlement at, at Rendlesham. And then the, um, the, tr the International Trading Port and, and Wick at, at Ipswich. And then Barry St Edmunds Westgarth Gardens, another one which I'm sure a number of you will have heard of. Uh, just clo clo closing in a little bit, um, the River Lark, which runs south of RF Lake and Heath, has um, got Anglo Saxon occupation and settlement pretty much all the way uh, along its length, from just south of Barry St Edmunds right up um, to, to Milton Hall in this area here. And along there, we've got numerous cemetery groups as well as the uh, the Lapford Cemetery, for one thing, the cremation cemetery there, and also the settlement at West Stone. And then about um, six miles so uh, southeast of RF Lake and Heath is the, uh, the small Roman small town of Icklingham with its fourth century inhumation uh, cemetery. And another cemetery which I'm sure you'll have heard of, the Hollywell Road Cemetery, a couple of miles um, south of Lake and Heath. And then on the, uh, the river to the north of Lake and Heath, we've got the Little Ooze with the Middle Saxon settlement at Brandon, and a little bit further on, um, the important town at Thetford. Archaeological evidence from, um, from RAF Lake and Heath was first discovered really in the first half of the 20th century as the base was being developed and expanded um, for uh, it sort of in that um, sort of middle of the Second World War. And we're indebted primarily to Grace Lady Briscoe, uh, Major Gordon Fowler. Um, and both fellows of this society, and Charles Lee, also a fellow, and also an Olympic sailing medalist, which we, we thought was uh, very interesting. Um, and they're the people who've really given us our, our background knowledge of this area uh, prior to any of the recent works. Our story really starts in 1957, when Lady Briscoe recorded the discovery of a single Anglo-Saxon burial from uh, Lake and Heath Airfield during construction work. This was then followed in 1959 by the excavation of 32 more burials um, that were excavated under her oversight. And this became known as the Little Ereswell Cemetery, which again I'm sure some of you um, will know of. In 1980, further, ex uh, further evidence was uncovered during the insertion of a water pipeline where um, another four burials were found. These were excavated rather unfortunately by the, by the, um, constru the, the construction contractors and little piles of bones and finds were left by the side for the Suffolk County Council archaeologists to, to go and record. So it, it was um, a bit rough and ready, but nevertheless, um, the information was at least recorded. So when in 1997, as part of ongoing base redevelopment, um, proposals were put forward for a new 500-bed dormitory about 70 metres south of the Little Ereswell Cemetery, um, archaeological evaluation was undertaken. Um, primarily, we were expecting to find outlying burials um, related to that Little Ereswell Cemetery. In fact, what we found was an entirely previously unknown cemetery um, consider consisting of 264 inhumations and eight um, cremation burials. 
um, and that's this area here. And uh, we started when we started the evaluation. We started in this area because we thought, you know, this was obviously the area that was most likely to have these burials. But in fact, we found this entirely new uh, new cemetery there. This was then quite uh, followed fairly rapid succession with work in uh, 1999 down here. And this was the area of those burials from the 1980s, where the, the little piles of finds. So we got a chance to actually go and have a look at that and put some context to those finds. <coughs> And then in 2001, we got the opportunity to go back to the Little Erisol Cemetery and revisit the area that was excavated in uh, 1959. And then with further minor works um, at this end of the large cemetery here in 2001 and 2008, um, we've been able to bring the total of uh, early Anglo-Saxon inhumation graves to 427 Anglo-Saxon burials and at least eight cremations all dating broadly to the 5th to uh, late 7th century AD. We're reasonably confident that we've got the majority of burials from this area. The only site which, where we don't sort of feel confident that we've got the edges is this one down here, the Eris 1046 site, where as you can see we've got burials continuing um, from this edge. And there used to be um, a swimming pool on, uh, in here. And Burials were reported, but unfortunately not recorded, in the late 1960s when the swimming pool was being put in. So we've got, uh, we're reasonably confident that there are actually at least a small number of burials here. Now these could obviously either be this cemetery continuing or, this, or a few burials related to this one out here. Um, or I mean, it's possible that this cemetery actually continues right the way up to the other one. But what we are confident of is that this is a def there's a definite gap through here. We've, we've had a look at a lot of this area, and there's a definite gap through here. So we are confident that we are dealing with three individual um, foci of burial, or um, three burial grounds. The, the, this lies in a wider archaeological uh, landscape, and work that's been done initially by Lady Briscoe and others in the earlier part of the 20th century, but more recently as a result of uh, developer-funded excavations, which we've done over 300 different interventions at RAF Lakenheath as a result of this work, um, has identified um, archaeology really over most, over most of the base. And this includes prehistoric um, settlement and burial scattered pretty much across the whole area, but most importantly, two large... Um, Bronze Age barrows here, one of which has got 7th to 8th century burials uh, cutting into the top of it. And um, these lie against this modern road here, which is called Lord's Walk. But in fact, excavation has shown that this is a driveway that dates back to um, at least the Late Iron Age. And uh, there's then Late Iron Age and Roman settlement focused around Caudal Head Mere here, which is a natural spring and the main natural water source, and also um, settlement and evidence of livestock management of um, the droveway here. And then we've got evidence of early Anglo-Saxon settlement running in a band approximately north to south and over the top of the Roman settlement. And at this point, we have to stress that although the Roman settlement um, was thriving at, into the early 5th century, the very beginning of the 5th century, We've got no evidence whatsoever for continuity of occupation between the two periods. And indeed, the evidence rather suggests um, a gap between the two. And um, then you can see the early Anglo-Saxon cemeteries here, and this Anglo-Saxon settlement about 200 metres north of uh, the, the cemeteries, and these uh, 7th to 8th century burials about 400 metres to the south. Um, and we'll, John's going to talk a little bit more about the chronology later on. And then we've got a smaller area of uh, 7th to 9th century Saxon Middle Saxon occupation, um, just sort of slightly further to the east. It is notable, I think, that each period of settlement moves slightly further away from, this, uh, from the water. And here we have got a, a, what was originally a watercourse that was filling with peat um, throughout those periods. So possibly there's an environmental reason behind that. The individual cemetery groups, um, are, they're all contemporary. So that at least for the, uh, for, the first, for the sixth century at least, burial is carrying on in each of these groups at the same time. Now that in itself um, suggests or implies 
that there is a specific reason that people that choices are being made about which burial ground the individuals are, are selecting to be buried in. So that in itself is obviously um, is obviously very interesting. Um, there's a lot of similarity between them. In most cases, burials are east-west aligned with the heads at the west end facing east. And burial in coffins occurs throughout the, throughout the sites as a distinct um, but minority rite. Mostly we think in probably tree trunk coffins rather than planked um, burials. And then we've got um, burials under small barrows in, on two of the sites. Um, again, very rare, only a couple of those. Two, we've got two graves, one on... Uh, this site, the Aresville 104, and one on 046 that are buried of men buried with horses. Um, and so we've got this sort of level of continuity or consistency amongst the sites. But nevertheless, there are also some very distinct differences between, between each burial ground. So for it to start with Aresville 104, which is the largest and the westernmost of the burial groups, What's really striking about this site is this, um, we have this shift of alignment of the graves from this group at the top where burial is really quite dense uh, in, in um, sort of a, nor a northeast southwest alignment, which shifts as burial becomes more dispersed in the southern area, shifts to a much stronger east-west alignment. Apart from that, there's very little evidence of, of really ordered, um, ordered burial on this site, apart from one or two groups such as here, where we've got a short row of uh, mainly male burials um, up here, and then down here, which this is one of the horse burials. This is the famous horse and warrior grave that, that hit all the papers in 1997 and has been on telly, and that's this one here. And we can draw a line around about five metres around that grave, which has got no male burials in it at all. It's only um, children, uh, mainly children, but children and um, Adult, adult females. So there clearly are, there, there is some level of um, order into um, and decisions being made about where people are buried on this ground, but it's quite difficult to sort of unpick it. When we come to 046, which is the southernmost of the groups and the one that was um, where the burials were found in 1980, you can see that this is, um, in here, people are buried in quite strong rows um, through this site and with quite a um, a concentration, it's not exclusively so, but quite a concentration of the, uh, the most richly furnished burials at the west end of the site. This is, you say, this is the one where the, the water pipe went through it, and here you've got, you can see they just managed to cut straight through the burial without damaging the rest of it. And then when we come to the Little Aeroswell site and the one we then dug again in 2001, what is distinctive about this one is that the burials are focused on a Bronze Age barrow, and you can see these are two uh, Bronze Age burials in here, and although there's no ring ditch, once we put the two, the, the blue graves are the uh, 1959 burials, and then our graves are the red ones on this side, and once we put the two plans together, it was really quite clear that there must have been quite a large uh, Bronze Age barrow um, that these burials were focused on, and that obviously it was still extant in the, in the 5th century. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> bone preservation is variable on the site, uh, but that's actually quite good for East Anglia, where most of the cemeteries have almost no bone at all. And this has meant that we've been able to do some um, analysis. Obviously, there's an awful lot of work gone on on these sites, and I can only present a selection of the analysis, and we're just picking out one or two bits and pieces. And one of the things that we've got are these quite high, a high proportion of juvenile burials on the site, particularly Aerosol 046, which is one of the highest in the region, only bettered by, uh, only, with only more at Great Chesterford at 49.7%. The problem is, is that that's the site that we haven't necessarily got the entire, um, we haven't necessarily got the entire cemetery, and therefore we don't quite know whether this is really telling us something particular about this site or simply that we happen to have that bit of the cemetery. Amongst these juvenile burials, uh, we've got 12 um, young people buried with weapons. This in itself is quite unusual, but in fact, if you look at that table, you can see that quite a number of them are teenagers, and we can certainly make an argument about people moving into adulthood. But nevertheless, uh, four of these are burials um, of children under seven years old, and one of them, you can see here, has got a spear with a child of six to nine months. 
So we don't really understand, obviously, what, what that's about, but it's very interesting to note. And it's quite interesting to compare it with the, the children with female gendered grave goods, of which there are 36 of those, so it's obviously a more common, and um, nine of those are under seven years old. We've obviously been able to pick out um, evidence of diseases and injuries. We've got um, a, a small number of cases of leprosy and polio in the, um, we can see in the bones. Um, high, a high um, number of burials with osteoarthritis, 30 to 40 um, percent of the of the group with. I think I might not have said earlier on, but we and the total. Yes, I did say it in that 427 burials. So 30 to 40 percent of of those accessible individuals. Um, is quite a large number of people demonstrating osteoarthritis, um, of which the spine was the most commonly affected. Um, there's also signs of, um, of physical stress, particularly in the lower limbs, and this is, is typical really of a farming community and people with uh, a fairly um, hard physical life. But what is interesting is a very low level of trauma, uh, much lower really than we would have expected. There is here, we've, there's a healed fracture, but really uh, a low level of that. And, and in only one grave have we got sign of, of any clear evidence of violence actually against the person. And even in that case, it wasn't fatal. Uh, there's a couple of cases of trepanation, which isn't really violence, uh, depending on how you view it, I think. Um, neither of them survived. So just um, coming on to some of, um, some of the research that we've been able to do. I'm kind of picked on this. As a, as a field archaeologist, I'm, I'm used to seeing the discoveries in the field and being very much focused on what we find in the field. And one of the things that has been so eye-opening for me, being involved in this project, has been the vast amount of information that we get once we come off-site and the evidence that is there in all, in all the objects which you think you've got it all. I, you know, it's very arrogant of us as field archaeologists, but you kind of feel you've done it once you've, once you've come off-site. Um, and I'm just going to share with you... Um, one, one or two elements of this before I hand over to John. And these are the mineral preserved organics, um, we, where we've got quite a lot of evidence for, um, for wooden artefacts on the site. And this is just one example. Here we've got a shield grip, and you can see on the underside of the grip, you can see uh, wood here from the shield board. We found that most of the shields, this work I should say was, has been done by um, Dr. Esther Cameron who's done all this work and I should have said earlier that Sue Anderson has done the, osteo, um, the osteoarchaeological work on the site. Um, we found that the, the shields are um, leather covered and the main woods are alder at 54%, willow and poplar at 32% and a small number, 10%, made of lime. So we're sort of getting a picture of, of the shields. And then on the other side of the grip, I don't know if you can see here, we've got little strips of leather that have been woven around the, around the grip to make the handling of the shield um, rather more comfortable. Of course, the, the evidence of the, the wood, evidence, the evidence from that wood, as well as telling us about the objects, obviously tells us a lot about the environment in which people are living and the resources that are available to them. And as well as um, the evidence for the wood, we've got um, a large assemblage of textile evidence from the site um, where it's been uh, in contact with metalwork. And this work's been done by uh, Dr. Sue Harrington. And careful examination of this has told us uh, about the um, assessment of the quality and the weave, um, the spin types, um, fabrics, and even in, um, some information about the dyes that were being used. And this helps us to draw up a picture not only of the clothing, um, that was being worn, but the role of textiles within the burial rite and the cloths that are available to that Anglo-Saxon um, population. Identifiable fabrics were mostly of wool, um, although we've got some limited evidence um, for flax. And the cloths range from coarse to fine textiles, although, as you'd expect, um, the majority are medium-weight cloths um, for, for everyday clothing. And um, mostly tutu twills, which are a a heavier weight cloth and provide a nice warm cloth, uh, a double layer of cloth, of cloth for the cloaks and more durable soft furnishings. And we've also got some evidence of patterns in 3-1 twills and diamond twills that will create um, both textured and the base for coloured patterns, um, perhaps blankets and covers 
and um, tablet weaves for, for belts, and, um, belts and braids. The largest assemblage comes from female burials, primarily because the, because the dress accessories are attached to the clothing and therefore that's where, uh, that's where the textiles survive. And in the male graves, um, the male grave goods tend to be further away from the body. And of these, the brooches have the most, um, largely because the pins pierce through layered clothing and often there's then a cloak or something else over the top. So you get um, textile surviving both on the pins and on the undersides of the brooches, but also on the faces. And in some cases, you've got fine, uh, very fine textiles indicating possibly head coverings or veils um, across, um, across the face. Some of the very finest textiles have come off the wrist clasps uh, where they're either on fine undergarments, long-sleeved undergarments or possibly even um, long-sleeved long um, overgarments on the very high status burials. On the brooches we've also got evidence of strings where brooches, where beads were strung between the brooches and we can see where the string in some places where the strings have been tied onto the brooches but also rather more intriguingly um, as in this case here um, evidence where brooches were actually um, sewn onto the clothing, either through the pin or actually through the brooch itself. Now that obviously, as an act, militates against them being used as brooches because once you've done that, you can't take them off again. Now, whether this is a specific right for burial, um, as a, you know, something that's, that's only occurring in that um, context, or whether actually this is some actually reflecting some gradual change in the use of brooches as time goes on, we, we don't know, but it's certainly something very interesting to know. Male clothing evidence is, is much more sparse, but what we, where we do get it, we tend to get it on um, the, the face of the buckles, and it seems to be showing, it's in folds on the face of these buckles, and it seems to be showing a loose-fitting um, shirt that's sort of flopping out over the waistband. I can't help thinking of something like... Um, um, J Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that. And apparently one of, these, one of these shirts has got a very lustrous finish. It sort of certainly gives the idea of someone rather dashing. Um, there is some evidence on the undersides of the buckles as well of a finer sort of undershirt and on no, on no occasion where, you've got, where we've got textile on the upper side and the underside is it the same textile. So you're certainly seeing evidence of um, the layered clothing. And then finally, we've also got some evidence for soft furnishings. Um, an example here where we've got, there's a wooden bowl with a, a copper alloy rim on it and it's got a fine, uh, or um, not a fine, an open weave cloth um, stretched across the top. Now this um, looks like it might be flax and there's evidence of um, some sort of variable thickness in the spin and, and in the weave, suggesting that it might um, that it might have had sort of thicker and thinner threads and perhaps creating a sort of a striped pattern in this. It's stretched across the bowl and it hasn't dropped into it, so it looks as if that bowl may have held, held something solid that kept the uh, that kept the cloth over it. Now it may be something just over the bowl, or actually that could have been a cloth um, stretched out over the whole um, over the whole burial. So what this gives us, um, as well as the evidence that we've got to, to tell us about the Anglo-Saxon clothing, I think looking at the soft furnishings takes, takes us away from the bare bones, as it were, of the burial and gives us a much more sort of colourful view of what's actually going on. And at least in some cases, evidence that whilst we see the burials laid out like that, in some cases there were actually cloths over the top and the burials may have been hidden um, from view. So... Um, that's really um, all I've got to say on this, and I'll now hand over to John Hines, who's going to give you some, um, a bit more information about the material resources. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Joe. Um, it was indeed the case that when we were in the position of putting together the research design for the post-excavation work at RAF Lake and Heath, Although we were in a position to be quite ambitious um, in how we approach the site, of course, it wasn't possible to do everything that one could conceivably do with the results of an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Um, and so our choice was very much indeed to try and focus on the material culture of this particular site, to see if we could 
put together a suite of specialist um, investigations that would um, illuminate in a way that hadn't perhaps been possible before, or at least not on this scale, um, just what material resources were available to these people and how they used them, what the technology was they had uh, for doing that. Um, however, um, I also came into uh, this particular project um, as I was very much involved uh, together with a couple of uh, fellows who are here today, Alex Bayliss and uh, Chris Skull on an English Heritage funded um, major project on the Anglo-Saxon um, chronology. Um, and one couldn't help bringing that, the, the, the experience that I was gaining all the time for that um, onto this project too. Um, so if you're all sitting comfortably and feeling cosy, contemplating soft furnishings up there, I'm afraid we're moving into a little bit more diagrammatic uh, section of the talk um, for a short time. Um, these are Oxcal-produced Bayesian models um, of the chronology um, of the site, the result of taking, um, in this case, mostly high-precision uh, radiocarbon dates um, and if using those to test uh, the validity um, of certain ideas that we had um, about the chronology of the site. Uh, now, a particular interesting one uh, is the one that you have on the uh, left-hand side of the screen um, as you look at it here, which is simply taking all of the dates uh, that we have available. That, oh, there we are, I've put it on now. Um, these are all of the dates uh, that we've got. We haven't split up male and female or anything like that in these. Um, from those earlier um, burial grounds, the three discrete areas that are quite close uh, to one another. Um, and these fit perfectly well uh, with the hypothesis um, that we have here, a single phase um, of burial um, that starts sometime in the 5th century, in fact we think it's probably relatively late in the 5th century, around 470, uh, 480, although the nature of the calibration curve means that you have huge amounts of probability will spread back to the early 5th uh, century as well, um, and continues in an unbroken uh, sequence to a particular point here. Uh, what we were also able to do was to take uh, those um, burials from the burial ground that's about 400 metres to the south, uh, ERL 203, um, and put in a model um, that said that the furnished burial grounds to the north came to an end and then burial started at the burial ground to the south. Um, the data statistically support that as a valid hypothesis However, it's also the case that there is another hypothesis that is statistically equally valid, and that is that the two burial in the two areas just overlaps. So the latest dated burial we've got in the northern area is maybe at the same time or a little bit later than the earliest one that we've got um, in the southern area. But since there has been a lot of debate um, within the field as to what happened to these big early Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, um, as you move from what we call the early Anglo-Saxon to the middle Anglo-Saxon uh, period. This is, to the best of my knowledge, the first time that we've been able to show, at the very least, a coordinated abandonment of the traditional burial sites and move to another uh, burial site subsequent to that. Um, what I've also got on the um, right-hand side, as you look at it here, these are the female graves um, that we have been able to date uh, from this uh, site and they are put into phases um, in a special scheme which merges the national series of phases uh, with an East Anglian series of phases which Karen Hoyle of Nielsen and I first um, developed and subsequently published by Ken Penn and uh, Beata uh, Brugman. Um, and it's particularly interesting if we compare um, the pattern that we've got here um, at RAF Lake and Heath, 
uh, with what we had in a much larger sample that was dated um, within the uh, national project where the um, curiously dog-legged, it looks like a healed fracture, doesn't it, if you can remember uh, that side there. This odd dog leg there represents a real problem that we had in the national sample in that we seem to have a lot of women from earlier parts, so I say up to um, the third quarter um, of the 6th century and then from the second quarter of the 7th century onwards. But it was questionable whether there really were any that were fitting in there in between that um, or there was a, a phase in which we didn't have uh, furnished burial. Um, in fact, in RAF Lake and Heath, not least knowing of this problem and really targeting, but going um, as close as we could for every possible um, example that we've got, we have got a much smoother line uh, running through there. We've got one date here that we've had to um, take, take out as, a, as an outlier. It doesn't fit within the model. That is going to happen with statistical um, predictability, but it is the, the only one, and even there, it's not that um, far out uh, from the whole thing. Well, just to talk now a little bit about how we can integrate this with the results of some of those specialist studies of the um, materials. There were two PhD projects were built into this project, which were undertaken um, at Cardiff uh, University with a specialist um, analytical um, supervision coming um, in the case of James Peake's um, study of the glass beads from Professor um, Ian Freestone, subsequently moved to the Institute. Um, here in London. Um, and um, Jim Peake um, found some very, very interesting evidence um, on the types of glass that were being used um, within the uh, glass beads. Um, the beads here are put into a chronological sequence going from uh, left to right following the work of uh, Beata Brugman, and it's very easy to see in terms of colour coding that the types of glass that are being used um, change uh, quite dramatically. Um, the key ones that I want to draw your attention to um, are first of all the um, pale blue um, bars um, that we've got here which do appear um, within our later phases to a degree and in particular with one particular type of bead um, but they're much more regular down there. Um, those represent Roman glass um, that is being melted down um, and reused. The dark green um, and the dark blue represent two types of glass um, which are really rather misleadingly known as Saxon um, glass. It's only Saxon glass um, in the sense that it, is, it was first recognised from Anglo-Saxon and early Anglo-Saxon um, contexts. Um, and amongst this glass, uh, Jim Peake was able to identify um, a very clear distinction between what he calls Saxon I and Saxon II glass. What this glass actually is, it is fresh glass that is coming in, is being manufactured in the eastern Mediterranean, probably somewhere um, in the Levant, possibly in um, Egypt, um, in huge blocks, and it's being um, traded um, across into uh, Western Europe. Um, here is a graph showing the distinction between Saxon II um, and Saxon I glass, and as we can see, there, it's very, very much a continuum there. Um, the um, distinction between the two, which is in the form of uh, manganese oxide and potassium um, dioxide uh, there, um, is very simply that to make um, Saxon I glass, or the sort of raw glass that's being used for Saxon I glass, into Saxon II glass, you are very simply adding in wood ash. It makes your glass um, go further. Um, it also, in fact, makes the coloration of the glass um, turn from translucent um, into opaque. Um, but just to briefly uh, nip back to this one here, this isn't just a minor change in what you're doing with the glass and making it go further or making it come out in different colours. It coincides with a really very dramatic change in the designs of the beads. 
um, that are being produced and it is therefore symptomatic of a much deeper change in the organisation um, of production uh, for this uh, community and we'll see more about the um, chronological and the social context of that um, shortly. Uh, the other PhD was done by uh, Matt Nicholas um, with the um, su specialist um, analytical supervision of Dr. Panayota Manti um, in Cardiff. Um, and we, we wanted to do, um, it was familiar from Anglo-Saxon cemeteries for non-ferrous metalwork uh, to be sampled. Typically 20 or 30 objects would be taken, samples would be cut from them um, and looked at in great detail and uh, readings drawn from that. We wanted to see what sort of results you got um, if you went for everything, if you tried to do um, a total sample. Now, in one sense, we could say the results um, really did say we, there's no point doing that again. We might just as well sample 20 or 30, but there's probably no point in doing that because we already know what the results will be um, in any case. Um, and much of the really important um, research that Matt Nicholas um, did, um, which was involved me a, a, a little bit more, was on use, or developing um, statistical methods for using relatively simple means of um, analysing large data and then produce, processing the results um, in a significant uh, way. Um, the interesting results um, though that we're getting in the, in the, if you like, the more presentable forms, more easily um, grass forms, uh, come out of this if we look at the, um, the range of the copper alloys we've got in there where we're looking at the amount of lead, the amount of tin, the presence of zinc uh, within them. Not surprisingly, we get a small number of copper alloys that have got no zinc um, in them at all and are therefore more like um, true bronzes or true gun metals um, in that way but zinc is extremely volatile so if you're going to lose any metal at all uh, from the mix or at least lose it to a level where it's below instrumental recognition um, it is going to be zinc and while there are a few interesting specimens uh, in those examples that are along that no zinc um, parameter um, there's no real pattern there the interesting thing is uh, therefore, while we have uh, some specimens with no zinc, um, we also in fact have a, a high zinc group that is appearing here, which is really very different from any sort of high uh, tin group or high um, lead group. There is something distinctive about this group which Matt um, finds as, as, as group uh, three there. Not least uh, when we go into this uh, what is making up this, we find that a very high proportion um, of the specimens are made up of these um, rather unassuming little things, um, objects called, called bucket pendants. They are simply little uh, model miniature um, pendants. Um, they're a matter of considerable um, interest uh, to me because it's an artefact type, um, the origins of which are to be sought right to the east in Europe, they're in Ukraine, they're in Poland, um, they're in the uh, Czech, uh, former Czechoslovakia, um, <coughs> I will call it, um, and they spread um, via the angles on the southern Baltic coast um, into Anglian England um, in, the, um, in the later 5th uh, century. Um, something like 90% um, of these specimens um, from RAF Lake and Eath uh, fall into this uh, special group here. And that brass-like alloy is also characteristic of Eastern Europe. They don't seem to be imported, but it does look as if we may have a manufacturing technique uh, comes in with the object. Um, it's also the case that some of these have these wads of textile um, pushed inside them. Um, because of analytical work that's been done in Poland, where they find <laughs> resins in these little um, pendants, which would have been aromatic and may well have been intended to be uh, medicinal as well as uh, dealing with sort of some of the consequences of not washing very often 
uh, which would be characteristic of, of these people too. We wanted to see if we could, we, we could sacrifice one of these for analysis and see uh, what results we got of it. I'm, I'm afraid to say the results were simply negative. We didn't find, there was no clear evidence of any lipids or fats such as we might expect of it having been um, impregnated, but it was certainly worth doing. And it was certainly worth also simply taking one out and checking that it was a piece of typical textile um, that had been rolled up and squeezed into the uh, pendant in that way. Well, as I say, I want to go back now and put those sort of results into more of a um, demographic and social narrative um, of the site. So, of course, it's got to be done um, relatively um, briefly. Um, Joe t mentioned the fact that we cannot see continuity chronologically, stratigraphically, materially between our late Roman um, deposits and the um, early Anglo-Saxon deposits um, at this site. Um, we would um, assign the earliest burials we can detect here to around the middle um, of the 5th century. Um, of the eight definitely identifiable uh, cremations, we have to say there's a great deal more tiny fragments of cremated bone turns up in the fills of um, inhumation graves, so there were pro probably uh, considerably more to start with. We have just a single well-preserved cremation urn. Um, it's the example that you see um, on the screen in front of you there. Um, and stylistically, um, this is parallel um, to the um, forms that have been uh, uh, identified by um, Catherine Hills and Sam Lucy in uh, co collaboration specifically on the chronology with Susanna Hackenbeck um, as phase B um, at Spong Hill and assuming we can or just making the, the, the um, pragmatic assumption that you know, we, we, we can um, transfer a sequence from one site to another site that's not all that far away, um, this would um, place that to around the middle of the 5th century, so something like a quarter of a century before the earliest inhumation graves that we can be confident of being able to date. Interestingly, amongst those very early um, inhumation graves, um, we have um, a hint um, we should say, or we had, I'm going to say, because it sort of changed a few days ago, um, a hint from the stable isotope um, study in that the um, strontium and oxygen isotope data that had been looked at from a small sample of uh, skeletons at Durham uh, University by Mandy Jay, working under the direction of um, Professor Janet uh, Montgomery, um, had picked up one um, outlier uh, in terms of the, both the oxygen um, and the strontium uh, levels, um, and they came back saying, well, interesting, that would look like, uh, like Denmark, I think they, they, they called it um, for there, and I checked that could mean anywhere, really, in the Jutlandic um, Peninsula. Uh, what they didn't know was, in fact, this was just about our earliest datable female um, inhumation burial, and it seemed prima facie, um, to suggest that we could indeed have a migrant from across the North Sea um, buried here. Um, just earlier this week, um, we got back some lead isotope data um, or a report on lead isotope data um, on this skeleton, um, and that in fact said, no, that looks like a British uh, signal. So, you, you know, I, there, there, there we are. In fact, one of the most exciting uh, things, I, I've always said I'll start believing isotope data when it shows me a medieval population who are buried and had never moved more than 30 miles um, from, from where they ended up in the ground. And that is actually what it shows us about the overwhelming majority of the individuals um, that we have had uh, sampled. Um, it's important, though, to stress that in terms of the chronological models, we also have two clear stages of use within that site, even if those stages um, are continuous. Um, the stages are represented by the fact that 
from the late 5th century through to some time around the middle of the 6th century, I believe, all three burial grounds are in concurrent use. At a certain point, um, the two least populous of the burial grounds, that's the two that are further um, to the east and the south, um, go out of use um, and only the largest of the burial grounds continues in use and in fact most of the latest burials are on that different alignment in the northern edge uh, or towards the northern half of that cemetery which Joe drew attention to um, earlier. Um, the, um, this change um, is a change uh, that we can also uh, model using our uh, radiocarbon um, data. Um, and uh, it comes out, the, the model fits with the, um, uh, the, the, the hypothesis, uh, or oh, sorry, the, the data fit with the um, hypothesis that are, are put to them. There's stage one in which all these sites are in concurrent use, stage two, only that. So I haven't put on ERL203 on the end here, but it would be perfectly possible to do so. Um, the transition at which this takes place falls according to the uh, radiocarbon data in a fairly broad period, at least to 95% probability, AD 510 um, to 560. Um, but in fact, that is influenced um, by the fact that um, anything that is going into the first half of the 6th century hits a horrible plateau on the calibration curve which spreads uh, probability back to periods which we know are actually impossible but nevertheless are mathematically um, uh, possible uh, too. Uh, something that really intrigues me is if we look at the mean of that distribution there, we come to that magic year AD 536, the year of no, no summer, the year of um, the, the thimble better, the, the, great, the great climatic um, downturn. I don't, as I say, for all those reasons, I, I think that's unreal though uh, curious. Um, nevertheless, it does suggest to us that whatever change um, is taking place, is taking place in the close aftermath of a major climatic event that we otherwise uh, most certainly know of. Um, now we can also then um, take these data um, and put them against the number of burials um, that we have got. Uh, very briefly in stage one, which may last 70, possibly up to 100 years, these are the number of burials that we've got um, in each of these um, burial grounds. Um, given that this time uh, an undateable um, proportion of burials in these two sites is 55 to 60 percent, to suggest that the 103 datable burials um, that we have in the largest burial ground should be matched by at least the same number um, that are undateable um, through the grave goods means we probably have 200 plus burials there. Um, th from the a mean life expectancy, this would mean we've probably got um, burial populations of those numbers for each of the sites, different sizes, and a total burying popul population of a hundred plus or minus um, a dozen or so there. In stage two, however, things are dramatically different. Um, there are only with that number of burials there, 70 burials left in the largest burial site that can belong to this um, second stage. It's certainly at least as long um, as stage one uh, in duration. Um, and incredibly, the burying population um, that is implied there seems to have dropped to that which is implied by the truncated cemetery, the incomplete cemetery, 046 something is pointing to a very, very dramatic drop in the burying population um, around this time. Um, and we have to emphasise, we know lots of Anglo-Saxon burial sites around here. If they all moved away and started burying somewhere else, uh, we absolutely uh, do not know where those are. I'm going to conclude by just briefly looking at some of the um, particularly interesting um, individual graves. Uh, this was the one that drew a great deal of attention um, to start with 
um, a youngish man at death, 25 to 30, buried with a sword, a silver-tipped uh, shield, um, uh, which was in front of his chest, held in a protected position there, um, a spear up there, and this um, horse, um, a horse that was truly uh, magnificently dressed, dressed infinitely better than any in person um, who was buried um, at this site. Um, a tableau that is representing that image of the figure, such as we get here. Note how very small the shields are. Look where it fits in there. That's probably um, you know, not undersized. <coughs> Um, in the picture um, there, um, uh, the large iron-bound bucket um, that was in there very conveniently. This horse was buried in harness that included reins, um, and we've got the remains of the reins preserved um, underneath the bucket as well, uh, as well also um, as um, evidence of very fine cloth overlying um, objects here, so it looks as if um, this particular burial uh, was covered in blankets as well uh, when it went into the grave. Um, this is a man I find very interesting um, indeed. Um, the shield is there, again it's in the chest area, but look at the way that hand, the left hand is bent up be behind it. He has been buried literally as if he is carrying, um, holding his shield in front of him in the grave. We've got the same typical um, spearhead up in that point there. This fellow was buried around about the same time as the, uh, the man with his horse there. But what really intrigued me was this uh, row of iron pins that we've got down there, just a little bit away from the leg bone and one of them um, over there too. Um, they're fairly, um, uh, well, you know, they're distinctly um, indistinguished, if you can use that term, undistinguished. Um, in terms of their actual uh, form. Um, but I was intrigued by these by being aware of the fact um, that amongst the uh, equipment that we've got in the big uh, military weapon deposits from uh, Jutland, we do have evidence of the kits of uh, battlefield medics um, who were with those armies. They include knives that can be paralleled in Roman army uh, gear, but also little um, collections of thorns used as suture um, pins um, and I do think it's quite like just as we saw trephination we've also got uh, medical evidence of some form of um, treatment to the leg uh, for this individual. This was quite an old man, I say that, 40-ish but old for this um, yeah, <laughs> old for this uh, the, the, this society what we also realised then um, was that what we had thought to start with was a very strangely placed coffin stain there. Um, it looks very much indeed too as if he was buried with a walking stick right beside his hand um, there and alongside that lamp leg. It's not a splint there, it's not an object that's left, it's a stain in the, uh, in, in the soil, um, but it's what it very, very much looks like. And I must admit, I cannot think of this sort of um, elderly warrior with a walking stick without re remembering the late lamented Professor Christopher Hawkes and how I used to encounter uh, him all the time. Um, musical instruments. Um, we actually have three graves of individuals who were buried with musical instruments. It's the only Anglo-Saxon cemetery where we have that. Um, the recognition of these is, I think, um, a very fine um, illustration of how the team that was brought together and has been able to work on these could do things. Um, I had picked up in the first run through of the, um, of, of the grave goods that there was something very, very distinctly unusual um, in the fittings here, uh, not least that this man seemed to have two um, incomplete buckles. There's absolutely no way you can put a tongue um, on this particular buckle. Um, it was then Esther Cameron who, having worked on the Prittlewell Liar, said she thought she recognised these as fittings um, that were similar to um, Liars, and Graham Lawson has subsequently uh, gone in and identified these as being uh, musical instruments um, of this kind. The really interesting thing is that here, in the case of this fellow, uh, we can see he had actually two spare sets of strings for his lyre um, in his kit. And as Graham said, it, that if you break a string on one of these, it's far too fiddly to put a new string on. It's much easier just to take your whole set of strings off, fit another one on, 
tune them up quickly and then you can get on um, and play in that way. We're learning things to all of these um, in that way. Um, as I say, three graves um, with lyres. Interestingly, they are spread out over the generations of the site. They're pretty much spread out from the early 6th century to the middle of the 6th century um, and to the uh, late 6th uh, century. So if you want to play with ideas of a sort of succession of minstrels, dare I use that word, um, in, the, in this particular com community, you can see that. It does also very nicely illustrate for us um, the continuity that we have got between the society that is there early 6th century in stage one um, and the society that we've got in stage two. I could, of course, both of us could go on and on and on and on telling you interesting things about this, but we hope this is um, at least enough to whet your interest um, to acquire you know, that great two-volume uh, report uh, when it comes out, um, which we hope will be uh, sometime next year. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.